Nai mai, haere mai, piki mai, kaki mai, kia ora e tiwi and welcome to 30 with me, Guy and Espina. We do 30 minutes, one guest and no cut. So what we record is what you get. Well, with Donald Trump preparing to return to the White House, tensions between the US and China may be set to escalate. Trump plans massive tariffs on Chinese goods, likely to start a trade war between the two rival superpowers who already square off over China's intentions over Taiwan. Where does this leave Aotearoa? China, of course, is our biggest trading partner, but our security interests lie with the US and its Western allies. The Chinese ambassador to New Zealand is His Excellency, Mr Wang Shaolong. He has held the position since 2022, and he's heard New Zealand concerns about Chinese Communist Party influence on politics here and human rights issues, including the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. How does he respond to those concerns? And what are China's intentions as it continues its remarkable rise to power and wealth in the world? Let's start the clock then. 30 minutes with Ambassador Huang Shaolong. Ambassador, welcome to 30, and thank you very much for coming into the studio. We really appreciate your time. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. If we start big picture-wise, I mean, over the last 40 years or so, China's lifted nearly 800 million people out of poverty. What is the goal in the 21st century? Do you see yourself as a superpower to rival America? Well, uh our goal uh, consistently over the past 40 years has been to reform and open up our own economy to improve uh, people's lives. And I think we've come a long way uh, towards meeting that goal. So uh, within the space of about 40 years, about two generations time, uh, we transformed uh, China from one of the poorest countries in this world to one of the biggest economies. And uh, as you yourself have uh, mentioned, uh, in that process, we lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, which is uh, quite an achievement, a, a miraculous development it is. And in you've done human that with history. You've done that with market economics and capitalism, really, haven't you? No, it's what we call uh, the Chinese socialism with Chinese, uh, with, uh, with uh, Chinese characteristics. So it's, uh, we're still a socialist country, but we've learned from others and uh, give play to the role of the market in that process. So do you see your economy as a capitalist economy or a socialist economy? It is definitely a, a, a socialist economy, but again, it's socialist economy with Chinese characteristics. characteristics. You probably don't uh, find uh, many examples like China's uh, uh, in the world, but in that way, China is a bit unique is based on our history, but again, by learning from others as well. That's fascinating. And I, I wanted to ask you, do you aspire to export that vision in the world? We, we've seen America export its soft power, mm. its cultural power, mm. massively in countries like New Zealand and throughout the world. Mm. Is the Chinese model something that you want to export? No, definitely not. Uh, it's something... Uh, uh, we have figured out that suits uh, for purpose for us, but it doesn't necessarily uh, could be easily transportable uh, to other countries because other countries have different their own different circumstances. And our uh, model or our system is based on our culture, on our history, and is a choice uh, by our people. Uh, and it has uh, proven uh, to have worked remarkably well for us. How does having Donald Trump back in the White House change things for China? Well, uh, whoever America elects as its president is a choice, obviously, uh, for the American people, and we respect that choice. Uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, our approach towards our uh, towards the re relationship with the United States has been has been very consistent. Uh, we have always wanted to establish and maintain a mutually respectful, peacefully coexisting, and cooperative and win-win relationship with the United States. 
that was uh, the approach we adopted during the first Trump presidency that was that has been the approach through the Biden administration. And I think it's going to be the same approach okay, but this we time, take going into sure. the second and, and that, Trump presidency. Yeah, and, and they are good intentions, and um, I don't think people would argue with that. But he is talking about 60% tariffs, even higher, potentially, on Chinese inputs into America. I mean, that's going to hit your economy, isn't mm. it? It's well, going to hurt you. Yeah. Uh, again, we want to uh, uh, establish a, a stable, healthy, and sustainable relationship uh, with the United States. And uh, uh, this out of the belief that uh, such a relationship would be in the fundamental interest of both countries. And it is also the expectation of uh, the rest of the international community. And uh, as on our part, we're ready to work with the United States to strengthen dialogue and communication to manage constructive uh, differences and then on that basis uh, build up uh, the mutually beneficial okay, cooperation. But how would China... But it takes two to tangle. It does. So, and how would you respond to those kinds of tariffs? Would China respond by putting tariffs on, on US goods? Yeah. So we still have time. So uh, we'll see how much of the campaign rhetorics will be translated into real actions on the ground once uh, the second Trump administration is in office. But uh, let me say this, uh, we have our own legitimate interests as well, and uh, uh, we hope to establish a, a constructive relationship with all countries, the United States included, but at the same time, if necessary, we'll take resolute and determined measures to defend our own interest. What might that look like? Well, uh, hope, because trade, uh, by nature and by definition, is mutually beneficiary. Uh, and and, and uh, uh, that has been the case, I think, over the past 40 years or so, uh, uh, which has seen exponential growth uh, in trade, two-way trade between the United States and China. And uh, both sides have benefited enormously from, from that trade. And hopefully uh, that, could, that could continue. So do you see yourselves as being a country that supports free trade? I mean, you came into the World Trade Organization. I mean, I think New Zealand supported your ascension to the World Trade Organization pretty early. Um, you believe in free trade? We do. Uh, and we have benefited from a... Uh, and an open economy, uh, an think, economy characterized yeah. by liberalization, by integration between economies. Mm. And in that process, uh, the Chinese economy has grown to this day. And other countries have benefited as well, including so have the we United got this, States. We've got the situation so where we've got a socialist for, Chinese um, yeah. economy that believes in free trade and a capitalist American economy which is wanting to put tariffs on. <laughs> is it, indeed, indeed. Uh, it's, it's a reversal of roles in a way because uh, many years back uh, we were quite uh, conservative uh, and careful with opening our own markets to the rest of the world. But at the end of the day, we decided uh, that it will be in our best interest to do so. And, uh, and at the time, uh, we were preached by a lot of countries, Western countries, including the United States, that uh, free trade, opening markets uh, will serve our interest and it will serve the interest of everyone. So we tried to be a good student. <laughs> we tried our best. Even uh, we experienced some difficulties in that process. But we tried to overcome uh, those difficulties and we made sacrifices in that process. Because uh, inevitably, uh, when you open your markets, uh, the industries, uh, the businesses, there will be winners and losers. But overall, uh, uh, the entirety of the economy has benefited. And that's why uh, I think we have managed to grow the economy over the years so much. And we have lifted so many people out of poverty. OK, let's talk yeah. about military spending and defence. What is China's defence budget? Well, it's, I can't tell you an exact figure now because, uh, but Well, officially it's, it's 230 billion US, isn't it? No, it's, it's, it's about 3% of our GDP. Uh, and uh, it's, And you're I what, think, a 15 trillion dollar economy or something? Well, it's, I think uh, the defense budget of any country is a, is a function 
uh, of its uh, the size of its economy. Do you deliberately keep that secret, though? No. No, you just, no, don't, you just don't know it off the top of your head. Yeah, fair, right. Fair, fair, so yeah. because if you read the budget uh, every year we make out of the MPC, the National People's Congress sessions, then you get the figure. Okay. The, Senator Dan Sullivan uh, from the US has said that your actual defence budget is closer to about 700 billion US, similar to the US who spends 800 billion. Do you accept that? Is no, it, that's not true. That's not, not nearly true. that big? No, not nearly. But not you've nearly. been increasing it. About I think because <laughs> they're trying to alleviate the pressure, the focus of attention on themselves. And the United States has, is the biggest, uh, by far the biggest spender on, on sure. defense. But, you, but you've been it's, increasing it. His budget is, I think, is bigger than the next, con next 10 countries uh, that, combined. That, that has traditionally been the figure, yes. But you've been increasing your defense spending at about 7% a year for the last three years, which is significant. No, it's in line with the overall uh, growth of the economy. And that's inevitable because yes. uh, with the growth of the economy, uh, with the growth of our interests, uh, to defend, uh, and, and it's absolutely necessary sure. for the, us to grow the budget sure. for the defence. The, the PLA blasted yeah, in an, pace. A, yeah, the PLA blasted an intercontinental ballistic missile over the Pacific for the first time in 44 years recently. Why did you do that? Well, we have a saying uh, in Chinese: uh, a bully can burn down a house, while ordinary people cannot light a candle. And certainly, on the testing of inter ballistic uh, missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, we can't hold a handle to some of the other countries. As you said, uh, we have done it uh, only once in more than 40 years. And uh, other countries uh, do it every year, and they do it multiple times do you plan every to, year. Do you and plan to do this on a regular basis now? That's not a question I can answer, but let me say this. Uh, I can hardly understand, and no one has uh, give me an explanation on why uh, China doing it only once in more than 40 years is a problem, while other countries doing it multiple times each and every year is not. New Zealand, along with... A... And, and by the way, uh, 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 some further points on this. Uh, among uh, the nuclear weapons states, China is the only one that has committed not to use... Uh, to a no first use policy, uh, meaning that we won't use our nuclear weapons unless and until others use nuclear weapons against us. Okay, we, and we, we are the only nuclear weapon state that is openly committed uh, to not using nuclear weapons against non nuclear weapons uh, states and against nuclear free zones. And hopefully, uh, other nuclear weapon states could do the same so that our world could be a safer place. We, we, we might return to that when we talk about AUKUS. I want to talk about uh, Taiwan. I mean, naval vessels from New Zealand and Australia sailed through the Taiwan Strait um, was September, wasn't it? We, were you okay with that? No, we, we have concerns. We have concerns because it's entirely unnecessary. And uh, uh, if anyone is truly interested in maintaining or seeing peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait, uh, we should all uh, so you support one China policy or one China principle mm. and support the peaceful unification so of, uh, of the country and refrain from doing anything that would add to uh, the tensions do you think in the New Taiwan Do you think Strait. New Zealand was adding to the tensions by sailing the vessel? Certainly it's not helpful. What are your intentions there? I mean, as you say, uh, and New Zealand respect, has respected this, hasn't it, formally, since 1972, I think, that the one China policy. Your intention is to, as you see it, have a reunification of Taiwan with China. Yeah, that's the aspiration of Chinese people on both sides of Taiwan Strait. Well, but the Taiwanese don't want that, though, do they? No. Looking at a poll here from the Taiwanese Public Opinion Foundation from September 2023, 12% wanted support Unif support unification, nearly 50% wanted uh, national independence and 27% wanted the status quo. So people in Taiwan don't want to be reunified, no, this... do they? No, <laughs> I don't think you can trust the numbers from these polls. And if you, if, if you check with the Taiwanese people, and most of them will tell you, uh, they consider themselves Chinese one way or another. And they uh, consider the 
a destiny of the future of Taiwan as an island and part of China, uh, with uh, the, uh, the the future of the entirety of, of China. And uh, on the part of uh, the mainland government, uh, we would very much hope that we can peacefully reunify our country. And that is our, still our preference. And that is, I think, in line with the aspirations of Chinese people. How will you do line. that? Yeah. How will you peacefully reunite? Yeah, but if, if we can all stick to the one China principle and if all our international partners could support us uh, and, and, and uphold their commitment, uh, not only playing lip service, but uh, walking the walk, yes. then I think we'll create the better environment and create yes. the conditions yes. for the country to be peacefully unified yes. sooner or later, and hopefully uh, sooner rather than later. What does sooner mean? Yeah, as soon as possible, as soon as possible, because the Chinese people have waited for too long for that. You've carried out a lot of naval exercises around Taiwan. Some see this as a, sort of a forerunner for a blockade, a naval blockade of Taiwan. I mean, are you prepared to go to war over Taiwan? Still, our preference is to peacefully reunify the country. Uh, but uh, we don't rule out any other possibilities because uh, if uh, separation or independence of Taiwan from the mainland is imposed, on, is imposed on us, we're ready to take all measures necessary to safeguard uh, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the country. Including war? Well, that's nothing is, is ruled out. Everything is on the table. But still, our strong preference is for peaceful reunification and we'll make every effort to achieve that goal. And hopefully uh, our partners uh, could support us by uh, again uh, delivering on their commitment to the One China policy or principle. Let's talk about AUKUS. Um, New Zealand has been invited to join pillar two of AUKUS. This is uh, pitched as a non-nuclear technology, a military technology sharing agreement between the US UK and, and China uh, and Australia. What is China's attitude about New Zealand joining Pillar Two of AUKUS? Mm. Well, uh, as far as AUKUS is concerned, there are a number of issues involved. One is uh, its implications for the nuclear weapons non-proliferation regime, which is one of the key pillars of the post-war international order that has helped to keep uh, the peace and stability in the world. Uh, if uh, because AUKUS entails, I don't know to what extent you are privy to this, AUKUS entails the transfer of nuclear weapons grade nuclear materials from, to Australia. No, from a uh, nuclear weapon state to a non nuclear weapon state for the first time in history. This is because this is the power is, the, 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 the Australian yeah, submits. Yeah. Uh, if that is allowed to happen, uh, it will raise serious questions about the consistency or lack of it for the NPT regime. And uh, it might end uh, the integrity of the regime as we know it. That's an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, about, what about the specifics of New Zealand's involvement in it? Right. But there's, again, there's a second aspect to it, which is no less important, because AUKUS is uh, the result or product of zero-sum Cold War mentality. Uh, as has been openly proclaimed by members of AUKUS, the organization has been created to counter the rise of China. And t if history teaches us anything, it is that these uh, exclusive blocks or alliances targeted at third countries, they never work. They never contribute to greater peace and stability. On the contrary, uh, they will lead almost inevitably to greater divisiveness, confrontation, or even conflict and war. And, and in, for that reason, we have serious concerns about about AUKUS. And you can't really separate the two, the so-called two pillars, because one uh, complements and support the other. As far as uh, New Zealand is concerned, at the end of the day, uh, whether New Zealand will want to relate to AUKUS or how it wants to relate to it uh, is, is a call to be made by New Zealand. Uh, we respect the sovereign, the full sovereign right of New Zealand to do that. But at the same time, we hope that 
uh, uh, when weighing up this all-important uh, decision, New Zealand would take into account, number one, uh, its own long-term and best interest, and number two, the potential implications uh, for regional security and the wider, again, nuclear weapons non-proliferation regime, and number three, the potential impact on the relationship between China and New Zealand. Well, let's pick up on that. Mm. What might it be? I mean, what would China do if New Zealand did join Pillar 2 of August? Because uh, we we have a, come a long way uh, in our relationship between uh, New Zealand and China. And this is, this is, I think, uh, has taken place as a, as a result of very hard work on both sides over many years. And uh, nothing happens in a vacuum and uh, nothing can be taken for granted. Uh, be it the trade links or uh, the, the people links, uh, what lies at the foundation is the mutual understanding and mutual trust uh, between our two countries. And as people say, uh, trust is one of the most precious, but also at the same time, probably one of the most fragile commodity. It, it may take years to build up. It just might take seconds to be destroyed. And would, would, would signing AUKUS destroy that trust? And we would advise against anything that threatens to erode that very important trust between us. Uh, we should be extremely careful. And, and as far as we're concerned, we're ready to work with the New Zealand side to build up that trust so that our relationship uh, in the whole range of areas could stand on firmer ground. So would there be economic consequences for New Zealand from China should we join Pillar 2? Inevitably, that will have uh, a negative impact on the relationship because it has, I think, uh, impacts on, for example, the perceptions of the Chinese people as consumers. Uh, Mostly, I think uh, New Zealand enjoys a very positive national branding among the Chinese people. But sometimes uh, when you read uh, the comments on social media uh, in China, uh, there is confusion or even concern about the state of the relationship. So I think that's something uh, we should, uh, uh, on both sides, uh, pay attention to as we go forward in our relationship. Because at the end of the day, uh, the, a good relationship between our two countries uh, is in the interest of both sides, particularly both peoples. If, and by, uh, I think, uh, through common efforts, uh, the cooperation between us has been, has been mutually uh, beneficial and uh, uh, we should uh, keep it that way. One of the concerns expressed, including by New Zealand politicians, about human rights issues in China has been the treatment of Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Is it true that up to a million people have been detained in re-education camps there? No. Do Categorically, have... it's not true. It's baseless. But think of it. Do you have re-education camps in Xinjiang no. for Uyghurs? Largely what happens uh, in uh, Xinjiang is uh, efforts or measures we've taken to counter uh, terrorism and extremism uh, in, in, in the region. And this is not very different from uh, what is being done in some of the other countries, including New Zealand. Uh, we have some uh, small programs for de-radicalization, but is <laughs> but think of it. So uh, how many were the, the accusation? The accusation: one million people. Do you know how many people are involved? Uh, that it's that's tantamount well, to about them? one fifth. Well, that's tantamount to about one fifth of the entire New Zealand population. Well, it is. So what yeah. are the numbers then? It, how many people are in re-education camps in Shinja? We don't have re-education camps. Frankly, honestly, we don't have re-education re camps. So are there no Uyghurs detained in Xinjiang at all? Well, not if they don't violate the law. Okay, but how many are detained at the moment? Well, uh, only those that have been, have been, have been have been tried and sentenced in in the court of law. Right. So, what roughly would the numbers be? Well, it's it's not nearly as many as one million. That's uh, that's a wild figure. That's a wild exaggeration, and 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 I think that has been manufactured for for a purpose uh, to smear China to make China look bad. Uh, but. Uh, 
I don't know why the people are so keen about the Uyghurs or the Muslims in China. Uh, and, and I don't know whether you've noticed uh, when, when, when there are countries that try to point fingers on what happens to the, uh, what we call the, the wayward people uh, in Xinjiang region. No one from the Muslim countries or the Islamic countries in this world has come out to say, no, this is what happens in China is wrong. Uh, this is mass violation of human rights. No, none of the Muslims or Islamic countries uh, ha has done that. That says a lot about the true state of affairs as far as the Muslim or the Weiwer or Uyghur people uh, are in, 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 in Xinjiang, That's China. That's an yeah, interesting point. Let's bring it back to New Zealand. In this city of Auckland, um, there are a lot of uh, Chinese uh, expatriates who mm. um, have come to live in New Zealand. In fact, about mm. 250,000 mm. all up in New Zealand. Does the embassy or the CCP in any way try to monitor or direct or control what these people do or how they express themselves? Well, again, categorically, uh, we reject the claims of so-called foreign interference by China in, 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 in New Zealand because all of them are baseless and false. When there's a protest, just can well, I ask you this? Can I ask you this? Let, let, let me get to this. Sure. Uh, Non-interference in other countries' internal affairs is one of the longest fundamental principles in Chinese foreign policy. Just as we don't want others to nose around in our own house, we never, and let me repeat, we never interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. And when uh, when it comes to foreign interference, we know who the grand or, or king interferer is. Uh, they do this by, 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 by launching mis- or even disinformation warfare in and against third countries. Who are you they, carry out, they carry out uh, <laughs> comprehensive and global uh, surveillance, if you talking about eavesdropping operations, you know who I'm talking about. And, no, and, be, and clear, they, be clear, be clear. Are, are you talking about, about Russia? Are you talking about they, America? They even do that, they even do that uh, by deploying significant surveillance capabilities in other countries uh, without even bothering to inform the governments of those countries involved. And, 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 and they also instigate uh, chaos and even color revolutions. And when all of these fail, they will engage in sometimes outright and blatant invasion of other countries. So if anybody cares about foreign interference, we know who, where to look and whom to look at. Well, who? who, yeah. who? Be but, clear. but certainly. Who, who, who but, are you talking but about? But let me say this. Suffice well, what, to just no, say, no, but certainly you do, not before, China. Before, certainly before not you China. Do that, you, you, know, you know as well, well as I do, who we're talking you, about? You, you be yeah. clear. Who are you talking about? Yeah, you know, you know who the king uh, interferer is, but but certainly not China. And these have, I think, uh, these have been manufactured again uh, for for a purpose to spread fear among the Chinese community, to sow discord between China and New Zealand, to serve their own ulterior geopolitical objectives. Okay, just about. But this is extremely unfair. Uh, because not only do they uh, do they uh, not reflect realities, uh, it's it's deeply unfair to uh, the members of the Chinese community here. Most of them have come to New Zealand because they think that New Zealand is an open, inclusive, welcoming, and friendly society, and they're worried. Can I've you, had can, some conversations with a lot of them, yeah, and can you claim, there's a lot yeah. of nervousness and fear, and they're worried that things are taking a disappointing turn. Are they? Hmm. Do you deny, though, that when there's a protest, or whether it's Falun Gong, or a protest over China's actions in Hong Kong, or whatever it is, do you not send people to take photographs um, of the people who are at those protests or harass them in any way? Can you, uh, can you totally rule out that sort of action? But <laughs> So we, we have uh, people, when things like that happen, uh, we had people demonstrating on different sides, and we have a lot of people taking pictures on the ground, yeah, of, of both sides. Uh, so the embassy would do that, would it? No, we don't do that. We don't do that. And, and largely, I think the demonstrators or the supporters, they organize themselves. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Okay. But and let me let me also add 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 this very briefly. We're we're following uh, the developments in relation to uh, the so-called foreign interference legislation. Um, again, we respect the full sovereign right of New Zealand to make its own laws. Uh, but at the same time, we hope that uh, it won't be done uh, in a way that would allow uh, misuse or abuse, or that would uh, uh, get in any uh, get into the way of normal relations between countries and peoples. And we have a large community here, and over the years, uh, these uh, have contributed enormously uh, to local development and to uh, the growth of the relationship between China and New Zealand. As 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 People of Chinese descent or heritage, they have a natural interest in the relationship, in what happens in China as their mother country. And, and what's wrong uh, with them supporting the development of China, supporting the growth of the relationship, and supporting uh, the peaceful reunification of, the, uh, of, of China? And, and suddenly, a lot of these would become problematic these days. And that's why people are nervous. Uh, people are, are no longer sure. Uh, people are fearful. Uh, and and uh, uh, we do hope that uh, uh, the, the legitimate rights and interests of the Chinese community would be fully respected here. And an and inclusive and non-discriminatory environment uh, could be created for them to study, to work and to live in this beautiful country. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Anderson. Well, it's a pleasure. That was 30 Minutes with Ambassador Wang Xiaolong. And this is 30 with me, Guy and Espiner. We'll catch you next time.